Let's talk about Newton's second law. Suppose that we use a rubber band to pull on a cart, and we pull in such a way that the length of the rubber band is constant. So if we manage to keep the length of that rubber band constant, we can ask the question, how would that cart move? Would it move with constant uh, velocity, constant uh, acceleration? Would it, uh, its velocity change uh, as the third power of time, second power of time? How would this car move? The answer to that question was given by Newton. What Newton figured out was that by applying a constant force to an object, the velocity, the velocity of that car would inc increase linearly with time. Moreover, if you didn't apply constant force to that car, but a force that changed with time, then the instantaneous rate of change of the velocity, which is what we call the instantaneous acceleration, that instantaneous acceleration would be determined by the instantaneous value of the force that is acting on the car at that time, of the net force, which is the sum of all the forces acting on the object. So the net force, according to Newton, determines the instantaneous acceleration of the object. So the equation Newton's second law says that the acceleration is equal to the net force acting on the object divided by the mass. Therefore, acceleration is proportional to net force. Now the force determines the rate of change of the velocity. That's what this equation is telling us. At a more basic level, you can say that the force changes velocity. This is the basic, most uh, important property of force, which is that every time a force, a net force, is acting on an object, the object's velocity is going to change. Newton's second law is the reason why we gave names for the first and second derivative in kinematics, as you remember, first derivative velocity, second derivative acceleration, but we didn't give any names to the third derivative, fourth derivative, and so on and so forth. Why didn't we do that? Why were they not important? The answer to this question is given by Newton's second law. Let me show you how. If you start with the position, then you can obtain the velocity by taking the derivative. If you have the derivative of the position, which is called the velocity, you can get the second derivative, which is the acceleration. If you take one more derivative, then you arrive to the third uh, derivative of position, one more to the fourth, and so on. So you can move to the right in this chain of quantities by taking derivatives. Or you can move to the left by taking integrals. If you, take, if you start with the acceleration and you take the integral of that acceleration with respect to time, the area under the curve, with some initial value for the velocity, you get the velocity at all times. If you start with, or if you use that velocity, as a function of time, you integrate it with some initial value for the position, you will reach, you will find the uh, value of the position at all times. So you can move left by integrating or right by taking the derivative. Now Newton's second law comes in by telling us that the force determines the acceleration. That if you know the force, you will know the acceleration. And we know that if we know the acceleration, we can figure out the velocity and the position with some initial conditions. Finding or knowing the value of the position and the velocity in turn allows us to calculate the force because the force in general could depend on position and velocity. A force that depends on position for example is the gravitational force between a rocket and the earth. A force that depends on uh, velocity would be air drag, the force between the air and the rocket. So by knowing position and velocity, you can figure out what's the force acting on an object. And if you know the force acting on the object, you can figure out what's the acceleration. So by following this circle, this loop of calculations, you can determine the trajectory of any object. For example, if the object that you're interested in calculating its trajectory is a rocket, you would start with some initial value for the position and the velocity, and uh, you would uh, use that to calculate the net force acting on the rocket which could be the thrust and the gravitational force and air drag. Knowing the net force, you would uh, be able to figure out what's the acceleration of the rocket, 
then uh, sometime delta t later by knowing that acceleration you can use that to calculate what's the new velocity of the rocket some delta t time later by knowing the velocity of the rocket you can figure out what's the position of the rocket some delta t time later using the new position and the new velocity you can calculate the new force acting on the rocket which tells you what's the new acceleration which tells you what's going to be the velocity and position some delta, delta t time later and so forth and so on so by repeating going over this loop billions of times you can calculate the whole trajectory of an object say a rocket going from earth to the moon notice that the third and fourth derivatives here have been left out simply because the force does not depend on them and they're not determined by the force if you're interested in finding how much are the third and fourth derivative you can always uh, take the derivative of the acceleration to get the third another derivative to get the fourth derivative but since they play no role in determining anything else they're just not important and we don't have to give them names suppose now that the force was actually proportional to the third derivative of the position in some engineering applications uh, they're given this third derivative of position with respect to time they give it the name jerk so suppose that you actually that Newton's second law was that the force is proportional to jerk so F determines the third derivative so an object that moves with constant force under the effect of a constant force would move with constant jerk constant jerk motion will give you a change in position that is third power in time so if the problem given to you was that you know what's the force and it's constant you would find out how much is the jerk and if you're given how much distance the object moves then the question could be how much time did it take the object to move over that distance delta x if that were the problem you'll be in trouble because that is a cubic equation you'll be solving a cubic equation to determine the time that is a very hard equation to solve so I think that we should be happy that Newton's second law in Newton's second law the acceleration is determined the second derivative is determined by the force instead of the say the third derivative being determined by the force because if that was the case I think that you would agree with me that it would be very hard to deal with jerks all the time Let's now talk about general properties of forces. We will discuss uh, more specific properties of forces later when we talk about normal force, tension, and so on. But right now, what we want to do is talk about some of the properties that all forces share. The first one is that an object cannot interact with itself. When people interact with themselves, they're called schizophrenics. But an object does not do that. Interactions always occur between two objects. What this means is that force requires an agent. If there is a force acting on an object, you can be sure that there must be an object, another object nearby that is responsible for applying that force for that interaction with the other object. It must be responsible for that force. Never draw a force acting on an object if you don't know where that force is coming from. If you haven't already identified the object that is responsible for applying that force on your object of interest. Second property of all forces is that the force between two objects depends on the distance between the two objects. Distance is always an important parameter in determining the magnitude of the force between two objects. Now, according to how the forces depend on this distance, we classify them into two groups. Some forces are only important when the objects are really, really close together, what you would call touching. So when two objects are touching, these forces are called contact forces. Examples of these forces are normal force, friction, tension, drag, hand pushing on a block, etc. All of these forces require direct contact between two different objects. The second group of forces is our forces that are that uh, 
act over long distances. They don't require very short distance to be of significant magnitude. These forces are called long-range forces, and examples of these forces are gravity, Coulomb force, magnetic force, and others. In this semester, all forces will be either contact forces or gravity. Now here's a few things to notice about Newton's second law. A equals net force divided by the mass. First one is that the acceleration depends on the net force. And net is the keyword here. Net force or resultant force means is the vector force that you uh, obtain after you have added all of the forces acting on the system. And the important thing is that you need to find all the forces acting on the system. If you don't know all the forces acting on your system, if you don't consider all of them and you don't add them together, then the net force will not be correct and your calculations will not be correct. It is essential that you find all the forces acting on the system. Second important thing to point out about Newton's second law is the presence of a quantity that we give the symbol m. The acceleration is the net force divided by m. m is called the mass and it is related to the amount of stuff that the object is made of. The mass is directly related to the inertia of the object, that is to the resistance that the object offers when an external agent tries to change its state of motion. According to Newton's second law, F equals ma, to obtain a given acceleration, the more mass, the more the force that is necessary. So if you have an object of, say, capital mass m, and you want to give that object an acceleration a, the amount of force required is, say, capital F. Capital F, big F divided by big M, gives you a regular size A acceleration. But if you have a smaller object and you want to give this object the same acceleration, then a smaller force would be required. So for the same acceleration, a smaller object requires a smaller amount of force applied to it, because little f divided by little m gives you a regular size acceleration. So the mass is what determines how much force is required to give an object a particular acceleration. Third is that the net force and the acceleration have the same direction. The net force and the velocity not necessarily have the same direction. To see this, remember circular motion? In circular motion you have centripetal acceleration and tangential velocity. So the acceleration and the velocity were perpendicular to each other in uniform circular motion, that is. So since the force is uh, in the same direction as the acceleration, you can tell that in uniform circular motion, as we'll see later, the force is always perpendicular to the velocity. Fourth thing to notice is that the Newton's second law is a vector equation. That means it actually is two equations in one. The vector notation is shorthand for the same equation written along each one of the coordinate axes. So Newton's second law in vector uh, notation actually means that the net force along the x-direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration along the x-direction and that the net force along the y-direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the y-direction. Now, if you know the acceleration along the x-direction, you can figure out the velocity along the x-direction, given some initial conditions, and you can figure out the position of the object. All you need to calculate the position along the x-direction is information about the velocity along that direction, about the acceleration, and about the forces acting along that direction. The same is true for the y component. If you know the acceleration in the y-direction, you can figure out the velocity, you can figure out the position. And one equation for the and the equation for the x component has nothing to do with the equation for the y component. These equations are completely independent of each other. So that means that some solving a two-dimensional problem using Newton's equations is the same as solving two one-dimensional problems. Each component is treated independently of the other one. 